Chandler Tower, Cherokee 4121 Tango. It's at Chandler Air Service. We have Sulu, and uh, we'd like a south departure, please. One does it set to be an angel? Where does the song go when it sleeps? Is every star that shines so brightly in the sky? Another promise I must keep. I know, I know, I should find out. Welcome back to another feature from Osh22, everyone. This one, though, is a little different than most. I love following the humanitarian efforts of aviation organizations around the world, and I'm excited today to bring you this interview with Mark Palm from Samaritan Aviation. We got a chance to talk out at the seaplane base, which is one of my favorite spots at Oshkosh. And to make it even better, we were standing in front of their newest, or at least new to them, Cessna 206. A beautiful airplane that they just finished kitting up for their mission in Papua New Guinea. You'll get a bit of the history of the organization and, and the mission that they're working on for some specific people who need the help halfway around the world. What a cool organization. And I love chatting with Mark. I hope you enjoy it as well. Welcome back, SBC listeners. We're back on a feature at Oshkosh 2022. I'm here with Mark from Samaritan Aviation, and we're going to talk about that organization as well as the beautiful airplane behind us and what they're doing. Mark, uh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks. It's great to be here with you today. Awesome. I always like to start with the personal uh, when it comes to pilots. Tell me what got you into aviation. You know, I have a his family history of aviation. My grandfather was a World War II pilot, and I had two uncles that flew airplanes. My cousin was a military pilot, and flies for Delta now, but um, yeah, so kind of an aviation background. Uh, what did your grandfather fly in World War II? You know, he flew P-51s, and then later uh, he flew the DC-4s, so oh. did cargo and... Yeah. Big and small. Yeah, both, right. and uh, so he got kind of the aviation in my blood, you might say. And how old were you when you started training? I was 19 years old when I start, first started flying. So just a few years ago. I would like to believe so, but it seems like a long time, lifetime ago, and uh, yeah, you're not getting any younger. All right. Well, you chose a different path in aviation. What drew you to missionary work and humanitarian work with, uh, alongside your aviation skills? Yeah, my father was a minister, so I kind of grew up in the church uh, with the aviation uh, background as well. And then as, as a high schooler, he ran a homeless mission in Santa Cruz, California, and so I had a chance to... Uh, go and help people and feed people when they were hungry and give them clothes and, and um, just love on people. And that had a huge impact. And uh, then as a 16-year-old, I went down to Mexico with my church, had a chance to see another culture and see a need and, and see how the rest of the world really lives and the struggles that they have. And so that really uh, gave me a new insight. I had a moment down there. Uh, uh, for me, it was something I felt God spoke to me. And, and what I heard was, Mark, I want you to use your passion for people in aviation to share my love in a remote part of the world. And so I came back 16 years old, back to California, like, what do I do with that? And uh, ended up in Florida at a small school, met a friend who was born in Papua New Guinea. And the two of us in 1994 uh, headed out and uh, got to see another uh, culture, a very remote place. And when you think of uh, remote parts of the world, Papua New Guinea is really considered the last frontier. And so seeing and hearing stories of people uh, trying to get to the only hospitals and, and taking one, th two, three, four days in a canoe and on the road to, to get to these hospitals. And that's really where this dream and vision for Samaritan Aviation came from. You know, the dream was how, how can we turn a three-day trip into a one-hour flight? And no one else over there was doing float planes. Hadn't, there hadn't been any av uh, float plane aviation since the 60s. And, uh, and so... Uh, you know, how can we do that? How can we reach all of these people that don't have access or hope when they have emergencies? And then the second part was, um, how, can we do it for free for the people? Can we do this and not be, have to charge them because they just don't have the resources? And so that was really the dream of Samaritan Aviation. And uh, so switching on forward, I also went to aircraft mechanic school for two and a half years to get my AMP, worked as an AMP mechanic for five years to, to be able to work and f fix these planes. And um, Started the organization in 2000, and uh, we're celebrating 22 years now, uh, 13 years in Papua New Guinea. And, you know, it was a long journey. It took us 10 years of telling the story, uh, 
to anyone who would listen, trying to get people to believe in a, in a, in a need of people that were 8,000 miles away. And mm-hmm. one of the main challenges early is like, wh- where's Papua New Guinea? You know, why, 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 do I, <laughs> why do I care? You know, why should I care, really? And so you're trying to, to explain that. And then, um, you know, we're, I was young at the time, and so I hadn't done anything like this before. So, you know, can these guys be successful? Are they, are, am I willing to... to part with my hard-earned money to support this and and finally we got the funding I moved there in 2010 with my wife and three little kids put the plane in a packed it in a 40-foot container shipped it over there put it back together in the capital of Papua New Guinea with a bag of tools and flew it into where we operate today and uh, what an amazing journey it's been Oh, that's amazing. I was going to, I've been wondering the whole time, I was going to ask you, why Papua New Guinea? And it sounds like it's because you met somebody in Florida who gave you the opportunity to see those people and it just kind of hit you. That was it. You know, the the calling for me was a remote part of the world. Papua New Guinea was one of those places I'd read about in National Geographic as yeah. a kid too. And just seeing the tribal people and the remoteness and just how they live. And and uh, whenever you add all of those factors, the medical service is really what is not happening, you know. And so there's no no way for someone when they get bitten by a poisonous snake and they have eight hours to live. If you're three days from the only hospital, you're not even going to try. And, and when you have a breached birth, uh, you can't get to the hospital. And so access uh, and hope, you just don't have it, either one of them. And so that's really was the goal for Samaritan Aviation. You know, the organization's name is Samaritan uh, because of the story and that Jesus told about who is... Uh, who is my neighbor? And he told a story about a, a, a good Samaritan. And, and that's really, we've taken that call and saying, the Papua New Guineans are our neighbors. We believe God ha- has given them value and they deserve a chance at life when they have emergencies. And so that's really the core of Samaritan aviation. It starts with a passion for the people uh, to love and serve them. And then you, you add an aviation as a tool because it's the only way we can reach these remote communities and offer that access and hope. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, in the research I was doing on your website, it looks like you have a significant portion of the medical needs have to do with childbirth, um, also some some um, injuries and trauma as well. So really across the board, anything that they need, you want to be there to get them to the, the help that they need, the medical help, right? That's correct. Yeah, 40% is, is kids and baby, as moms and, and, and babies. And uh, and then we have everything from malaria, tuberculosis. Uh, there's still tribal wars happening over there with spears and machetes, and so there's some trauma there. Uh, also, a lot of sickness outbreaks. We've had cholera outbreaks that we've responded to. Uh, polio came back to Papua New Guinea in 2016, and we spent several months delivering hundreds of thousands of polio vaccines in the area to help stop that outbreak. And uh, we continue to offer services for disaster relief. We also uh, deliver medical supplies to 40 different aid posts. And so there's, we've delivered 200,000 pounds of medicine in these little airplanes to these remote communities. Um, and before we got there, it was taking three to six months to get those medical supplies. But in this plane, you pick them up and you're there in a couple hours and it's, uh, it changes. It, it, so you look at, uh, you know, exponentially, how many lives have we saved? You know, uh, we've flown in 1,700 evacuation flights, emergencies, but we've saved thousands of people through delivering medical supplies and responding to disaster reliefs as well. Yeah, and while your focus is narrow geographically with Papua New Guinea, um, I, I'm wondering, have you set sort of an example for other organizations to do this elsewhere? Um, what kind of reach have you had there, if any? You know, we, we've partnered with a lot of organizations. It's a very unique situation. So, so Papua New Guinea is the second largest island in the world. Where we work, it's 250,000 people along a 700-mile river. And right now, we're looking at expanding ourselves to the other side of the island. There's 14,000-foot mountains in between Mm. the river we're working on now and the river where we're going to go here in the next uh, 12 months. Uh, But the need is great. In the area we're going, there hasn't been any medical service in 20 to 30 to 40 years. And so we believe we have a model that works, Mm. and we believe we can go offer that assistance. So I'm hoping we're inspiring other, other organizations to do what we're doing. Um, but it takes it takes partnerships. You know, we've been blessed to have uh, individuals, foundations, churches uh, sponsor us, as well as the pa- Papua New Guinean government uh, gives us about 30 percent of our operating oh. co- budget uh, in grants in the country. And so we've been a partner with their, with them, and we expect that to continue as we expand into the other side of the island. Excellent. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how your operation works, which could be pretty interesting. How do how do the folks in need get in touch with you and how do you respond? How does that all work? Yeah, so when I first went over there in 2010, there was a lot of HF radios in the villages, so high frequency radios, kind of similar to ham radio. 
Uh, so they would get a hold of us that way. Uh, and over the years, they've been putting cell phone towers up. And so uh, still today, a lot of times a villager will have to run 30 minutes, climb a coconut tree to find a signal, or they'll climb a couple hours and climb a mountain and call us. Or there's places if they hike down, they can get to certain parts of the river that have uh, cell phone connection. And so we have someone that has a, a phone 24-7 that we answer that phone and, and triage to see if it's an emergency and kind of what level of emergency it is. And then what do we need to respond? If it's a snake bite, we'll go get the anti-venom, take the anti-venom straight to the patient. If it's a birthing challenge, we try to get a midwife to bring out as well. And we work with the local hospital there and use the national Papua New Guinea nurses uh, to help us as well. And then we also have a, a trauma nurse on staff who's our medical director. And uh, they're the ones that, he's the one that triages and will go on the, the very severe emergency flights. Okay. And how many airplanes are you operating? We have two currently over in uh, Papua New Guinea. This will be going over later this year. We're really excited to show this off at Oshkosh and, and so people can really get a tangible visual uh, of the airplane to see the stretcher that's in there. Um, and this will be packed in a container and in December it'll be shipped over and hopefully be operating by March of next year. Excellent. Um, from what I can tell in the research that I've done, uh, you have uh, families go over as family units, sort of uh, missionaries offering their services, uh, pilots, mechanics, and so on. Are they rotating or do they go over on a full-time permanent basis? Yeah, so our, our kind of our model is two years on, six months off. So two, two years in the country, six months back in the States, kind of talking to their supporters. All of our, our pilots raise their own support, all of our staff does. And so it's good to come back, tell the stories, see their families, get their kids acclimated, uh, back into society a little bit, education, our doctor appointments and all of those things. Um, and so it's just kind of a two year on, six month back home telling the story. Uh, and because we, we found, you know, you have to get over there, you have to learn the culture, the language. Uh, it takes a pilot about eight months after he arrives in New Guinea really to be flying by himself. And so there's just a lot of training that goes into it and a lot of preparation. And myself, I went over there, my, my youngest was four I had a middle one at five and my oldest was seven and, and when my wife and I moved over there and so it's a really a family effort and and that's really too the passion that all of our staff have is that the families are involved it's not just the the, the pilot going out and flying it's the whole family so that so the, the kids are in the hospital feeding patients and, and clothing patients and praying with patients the wives are there as well it, and my my wife was you know the the she drove the ambulance. She was the weather lady when I needed weather reports because there isn't any weather over there. And uh, you know, it was a team effort. And so that's really how we, we see it. And that's how the, the staff that come over, that's how they want it. They want their families to serve and they want their kids to see another culture and see what the rest of the world lives like and how we can serve others through our actions and what we do with our lives. Awesome. Well, tell me a little bit about the airplanes themselves. Uh, what are you using here? How have you modified them and so on? Yeah, we use Cessna 206. This is a 1976 uh, F model. Uh, we have two uh, G models over there as well, but we basically take an old plane like this. Uh, we bought it for a little over 150000 and we've dumped about 600 into it since we bought it. So, you know, Aeroset floats. Uh, there's 100000 The right-hand door for the Whip Air right-hand door is a 35000 The flint tip tanks is another twenty. Thousand that gives us an extra couple hundred pounds of useful load as well. We also have the Sportsman Stole, which gives the uh, the flaps will droop with, uh, excuse me, the ailerons will droop with the flaps as you put them down, give you extra lift. Mm -hmm. We put a, a, a leading edge cuff as well. We upgrade the engine from an IO520 to an IO550. Our partners at Western Skyways do these engines at, at cost of parts only. They've been an amazing partner of ours. Uh, we put a 86 inch uh, seaplane prop on there we redo the in interior we we look over the plane and um after that it's ready to go and then we'll finalize it with vgs on the plane when we get it to papua new guinea okay all right excellent and what kind of operations i know it's all seaplane work um you're landing in rivers in the ocean uh some of it difficult to get to talk a little bit about the skills that the pilots need to develop as they get effective over there yeah, so we operate on a 700-mile main river. It's called the Sepik River. It's up to 1,000 feet wide in some places. And the amazing thing about this river is it'll the, the level of the river can rise and fall by 20 feet just in a week. And so you have some major fluctuations. You'll have sandbars that are three feet high one week. The next week they're covered up. Uh, and you've got a lot of uh, logs, huge trees floating down the river. You've got crocodiles, fishing nets, people in canoes, and, and the constant 
change in the color of the water is the color of chocolate. So you could see about two inches below the surface. <laughs> So it really takes a lot of, of, uh, of good, probably the biggest thing our pilots have is good judgment. Um, you know, for me, especially when I launched this, uh, the first few years, I mean, I had, I couldn't go in by, on the ground to check out spots. Everything I went into was assessed by the air. So it was very nerve wracking to, to, uh, to, to hope, you know, you can't see very far, but you make an educated decision. And it's been amazing. We've flown thousands of hours. We've, we've had zero incidents, zero accidents in the last 12 years. Amazing. Uh, we've got great pilots, and uh, and they they do do a lot of training on this side. It's not just about going down to a flight school, getting your private license. They're, all of our pilots are commercial instrument, and they also have mountain flying experience. They also have done bush type flying um, experience as well as the seaplane. And so uh, we we have an assessment process. They actually go to to a, to a, a SMAT, which is School of Missionary Aviation Technology in Michigan. They do a flight assessment. That's kind of the first step. Uh, and if they can get through that, which is not very easy, uh, then we kind of go down the next step. And we, but it's a, uh, it, it's a very long process. And uh, as I tell these these guys, look, you, you, you get assessed psychologically. Your families are interviewed. You have to be a great pilot. You have to to love people. And then you get the privilege after all the work you've done all these years to then go and raise your own support <laughs> yeah. for your salaries and uh, and come over and serve. And that it really is a privilege. And 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 the staff we have is just amazing that is amazing i i had no idea that they were raising their own funds and everything to go over there that's incredible um so um when it comes to um maintaining these aircraft do you find it difficult uh to to get the parts you need um, the expertise you need and so on while you're over there or has that been working out really well you know, parts are always a struggle, you know, especially when we only had one aircraft. I remember one time, uh, you know, we had one airplane, we we needed a part, it was taking two weeks to get there, and I had to turn down 18 emergency flights while I'm waiting. And there's nothing more frustrating than to hear someone call you and tell you that someone's dying and then you're waiting on a part. Uh, and so yeah, having two airplanes is huge, um, but parts are always an issue. You know, you try to get the ones on the shelf that break the most, and then there's all those, always those ones that you're not ready for and, and it takes time. So that's, a, that's always a big struggle. It takes about two weeks to get anything uh, all the way to Papua New Guinea. And it's very expensive as well. Shipping, especially nowadays, is, has gotten extremely expensive. Um, corrosion is a huge issue. We, we live in the hangar. The, the planes live about 1,000 feet from the ocean. And there's trade winds. And so a lot of salt water. Uh, we land on some brackish water. We don't do a lot of open ocean uh, mm -hmm. operations just because it's so rough. Um, but we do do a lot of brackish water operations close to the ocean. And uh, yeah, corrosion is our biggest challenge. I mean, it is something that we're, we're fighting on a daily basis. Hmm. I, this may be a dumb question, but I presume all of your operations are VFR. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the plan for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah when, when, when you're able, when you don't get yeah. caught in something, right? Uh, so how much does weather play a factor in being able to accept a mission, uh, it must also be frustrating when you can't get somewhere because it's socked in or something like that. Yeah, weather comes up quick in the South Pacific. You know, it's hot, humid, density altitude is about 3,000 feet when you're at sea level. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the weather does come up quick. I mean, I think over the years, thankfully, I've only had to turn down three or four flights. You know, sometimes we can wait. It, it passes through quick or we can find a way around or, or under or over. Um, and, and so, you know, even though it is a, it's a challenge, it's something we've been able to work around and, and be successful most of the time to accomplish the mission. But yeah, weather in New Guinea, it's, it just will pop up and blow up. You'll be on the river and it's big cells coming at you and you're trying to load a patient on before the winds pick up the 40 knots and the, the rain starts uh, uh, coming down in sheets. And so, yeah, there's, there's always those added variables that make it hard. I'm guessing sometimes they have to wait it out there on site. Yeah, I've had to wait for storms to pass. I've had to park uh, downriver, you know, 20 miles and wait for the weather to get better. Um, but the good news, you've got 700 miles of river. You know, one of our T-shirts a few years ago said on the back, it said, ask us about our 700-mile runway because <laughs> we're float planes. We can land anywhere. And so that gives us a bit of an edge. Uh, if the weather's bad, we put it down and we wait it out. And it just gives us a chance to go hang out with the villagers anyways and develop relationships. So it's not it's not a bad thing unless, unless someone's dying and you're not able to get out. But... We, we've been able to, uh, we've never had anyone die while we're waiting on weather. So that's, that's been a blessing as well. Excellent. Well, Mark, uh, those people who are watching this or listening to this, what would be your call to action for them to be able to help out if they're so inspired? 
you know, for me, it's been it's been a, a, an amazing journey. All of our staff to be over there, kind of the tip of the spear, so to speak, saving lives and uh, and uh, visiting these families. And there's nothing like going back in and seeing someone that you've saved and that wouldn't be alive if you weren't there. But the reality is we can't do that without people coming alongside of us and and our partners here in America and around the world. And so I just encourage you, if this is something you'd like to be part of, we'd love to have you go to our website at SamaritanAviation.org. You can look at Facebook, Instagram. We'd love to have you partner with us because we can't do this on our own. It's a collective effort, and uh, we really consider our donors uh, their partners. And, and it allows us to go and offer access and hope uh, to bring uh, the hands and feet of Jesus to these remote communities, uh, which is what our goal is at Samaritan Aviation. Mark, this sounds like a just an amazing effort. We appreciate your taking the time today to talk to us a little bit about it, and best of luck to you. Thank you so much. It's been great to be with you today. Thanks. Again, I love seeing all the great humanitarian efforts going on around the world from pilots, and Samaritan Aviation is no exception. If it strikes you, please find a way to help out. Thanks for watching. Please let me know what you think. You can reach me via email at bill at studentpilotcast.com or on Twitter using at Bill Will. That's Bravo India Lima Lima, Whiskey India Lima. You can also hit me up on the website's contact form at studentpilotcast.com. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, we would always appreciate a sub, a like, and of course, comments and shares. We've just started our little channel after being almost completely audio focused for years. So any little bit helps to get the word out. Until the next one, keep your head in the game and learn something about flying today. I'll catch you later. Just shout to the